So for this week on Cyber School and kind of a new series that we'll start doing um, kind of interim through the weeks is we've got some time in between some of our major releases that, uh, you know, the wider world will start hearing about uh, in the very new future. We're going to start covering um, just general setup and configuration on a lot of our products. I figured this would be a helpful series that we could go through just kind of going through a basic setup in terms of what settings are required and where you can find those resources um, through cyber data. So with that, we'll start with one of our big movers, the Cyberdata SIP paging adapter, part number 011233. So for the whole setup process, there's a couple different parts and pieces that you're going to want to configure or adjust as you're going through the, the process. And of course, one of the most important bits, it's in the name, the SIP paging adapter is going to be the SIP setup. But then there's also the multicast portion of the paging adapter that's not required, but it's used in a lot of set um, a lot of instances, especially when you're using the paging adapter in conjunction with some of our other products like the paging server, a multicast microphone, some of our call buttons, you know, what have you, um, you know, multicast setup can be very uh, useful in certain instances, but it is an optional thing. You know, you don't necessarily have to set that up. And then, of course, there's the network settings, device and miscellaneous settings. So there's some key features in there that people like to use and probably are most commonly used features are in our uh, device and miscellaneous settings sections. And then finally, the important bit when dealing with this kind of product is the actual wiring up to an analog amplifier. So with this, you'll get an idea of the different settings and adjustments that you'll need to make as you go through setup with a particular product. So first and foremost, when you're dealing with SIP setup, it's going to vary from platform to platform. There's no one size fits all. You do this and then you do that and then it's all set up and configured properly. It's really going to vary between the different providers. So there's no, again, one size fits all um, style setup or recommendation that I can give as we're going through this. It's really gonna vary depending on the platform that you use. And, you know, some are using, um, you know, kind of old, more old school models where you basically get, you know, a couple credentials, you plug it in and it's ready to go. Some are a little bit more complex and require things like an outbound proxy or a different SIP transport protocol such as say TLS instead of the standard UDP. Um, and some providers such as Zoom actually handle all of the configuration for you by auto provisioning. So you literally just plug and chug a URL that you get from Zoom, you check a box and you reboot it and the thing is set up. So it really varies um, with the different providers that you can work with. Um, some also require another thing called an outbound proxy. That's basically a essentially a gateway or a way or a specific address to send all the traffic to um, that typically deals with um, you know, potential threat control or load balancing on the different provider servers. So it's really going to vary between the different um, platforms that you work with. But for basic, basic setup, when you're setting up the SIP paging adapter, you're going to do some form of SIP setup. And if you're not sure about setup or how it's going to work, depending on your provider, um, check out our huge library of different configuration guides that we have on our website that can help walk through that configuration process. But once you get that aspect of it done, you can move on to multicast setup. And our multicast setup um, is going to be essentially the same across the vast majority of our products with a couple exceptions. But the, the multicast system works in a priority based hierarchy where nine is going to be your highest priority and will play over everything by design. And zero is the lowest priority and everything will play over zero. So it basically works is zero is lowest, one plays over zero, two plays over one and zero, so on and so forth. Um, so that way you can go and designate different um, multicast uh, addresses or I, I guess broadcast zones, what have you, um, that are going to be more higher priority that will always play. So that way, in the event of an emergency, you don't have somebody kind of, you know, announcing what kind of special tacos or sandwiches or what have you they're having for lunch. And there's an actual emergency. Emergency can come through at a higher priority. And, you know, the lunch specials are going to get canceled out when they're announcing some kind of tornado that's incoming or what have you. Um, to that end, you know, as you're dealing with the multicast setup and dealing with some of the other other um, protocols and things that work with the paging adapter, we need to understand where SIP calls um, would fall into that hierarchy because you can't have one system working completely independently and not have the other have some kind of counterplay with it. And a standard SIP call that we would have set up uh, via SIP registration in our last slide there is going to be treated as priority 4.5. So that way, any multicast streams 
four and below, so zero, one, two, three, and four, um, are going to be superseded or be played over by a SIP call. So that way, if it's kind of general, not emergency stuff, and you want a SIP call to play over it, use priorities four and below. And then if you want more of a higher priority, say emergency or just a general all call non-emergency to play over a SIP call, you would use priorities five and above. So five, six, seven, eight, and nine. So that way you get a lot of capability to go and actually designate the multicast setup in there and design a system that'll work how you want it. And as you're going through that process, you're going to use a multicast address and port combination that are required for each group setup. Um, and you can get these either from, say, if using in conjunction with some of our products like the SIP paging server or our call buttons or even, you know, other VoIP equipment such as a Polycom phone or a Yealink phone that support multicast output, you'll take the addresses and ports used from the sending device and input them into the receivers, effectively tuning the paging adapter or other uh, subsequent equi equipment into the broadcast from the sending devices. And for conversation sake, because it can get really confusing when you're talking about a multicast priority and addresses and ports, you really can just uh, refer to these as zones. They're essentially the IP equivalent of a physical zone that you would have with an old school zoned amplifier that would have a whole separate set of wires that would go off to this different zone. It's effectively the same thing um, in terms of functionality when you're dealing with multicast. Each of these different priorities, which is made up by an address and a port, can be considered a colloquial zone. So that way it's easy to refer to and easy to understand. The next part that you can set up when you're configuring one of our devices is going to be um, network settings. And this is the address information that your device will use. And more often than not, using just the standard DHCP where the devices just get on the network and they get given an address and they stick with that is generally good enough for most instances. But one thing that really makes it easier to manage is setting up what's known as a DHCP reservation on the actual server itself, not on the cyber data equipment, but on the DHCP server, sometimes your router um, that's providing those addresses, just make a reservation on the server instead of configuring it on the paging adapter and setting it up statically that way. Just because it makes it easier and gives you a single pane to manage everything there, we recommend doing it that way. It's a lot easier to work with in that instance instead of having to remember all of the other um, equipment that you have to configure. Um, and of course, you can assign stuff statically, as I was mentioning, if you like, or you can actually go in there and say that the device has this specific address, this gateway and what have you, you can figure all of that particular information as necessary if you want to go that route. But we do recommend using DHCP reservations because it's a little bit easier on the actual implementation side and the people that have to manage it, um, it gives you a single pane to go and manage everything. So that's more of a, a kind of recommendation there. And then finally, kind of the big thing that you'll deal with in more enterprise or school level setups is going to be your VLAN configuration, which are essentially different um, virtual local area networks that you can configure the devices and kind of sequester or put traffic in a specific area to kind of group everything together. You've got all of your phone traffic over there, all of your regular computer traffic here, your guest Wi-Fi access over there, and it's all segmented virtually instead of having separate copper lines and separate e separate ethernet cables for everything. You can do everything virtually. And you can go and adjust the VLAN options on our products in either DHCP mode or static mode. So you get a lot of capability there where you can still have your DHCP server manage all of the address information and assign the device's VLAN information manually. So you have all that cool capability that's in there. And again, this is all optional. You can just leave the devices in the standard DHCP mode that they ship in and your are good to go. It really depends on how your network is configured. Finally, we move on to some device and miscellaneous settings. And these are just some different settings um, that interact with the device as you're setting it up and give you some different features and stuff to play with. Stored message playback um, basically allows you to use pre-recorded messages and just trigger them with a DTMF button. So that way, when you call the paging adapter, it'll you know press zero to page, press one through nine for stored messages, and it gives you capability to play a particular message 
uh, at your discretion. So it can be, say, you know, a morning huddle notification. It could be, say, a blue light special or different, um, you know, specials that are going on in a Kmart or some other store, you know, what have you. It gives you that kind of capability to pre-record those messages and just play them back with a single button press. But by far the most common setting that we have um, across all of you know, the different settings that we have on the paging adapter is going to be the setting bypass DTMF that basically just skips any IVR or menu that you receive when you call into the paging adapter and you just get a beep in the handset and then you can talk and say what you need to say to get that uh, audio through the overhead speaker system. It's by far the most common option because people are just looking to pick up a phone and make an overhead announcement. They don't want any bells and whistles or stored messages or anything like that. It just bypasses everything and literally just goes straight to the page. That's all you want to do. Another super common feature and is required in a lot of instances for our next aspect that we'll get into for the actual physical wiring of the unit is activating relay on local audio. And what that does is it just activates the physical relay when any audio is going to be passed through the paging adapter itself. So either when it's in a SIP call and it's receiving audio to then transmit via analog wires, it just triggers that onboard relay and does the same thing for multicast or even line in audio if we're utilizing the RC line in port of the paging adapter. So with those, with that setting, it gives you a lot of capability to just um, manually trigger some different amplifiers. And on that, arguably the most important bit of the SIP paging adapter is wiring it up to whatever particular amplifier you're going to be using. It's all well and good if we've got this magic box that will fix all your problems and allow you to connect to an analog amplifier. But if you don't know how to wire the two things together, it's really not doing you anything good. So um, with our different uh, products that we go and integrate, we've always got a lot of different wiring diagrams to work with. So that um, kind of leads into our final step here. And when you're dealing with um, connecting to an amplifier, there's a, basically two different options that you can utilize in some form or function to connect to a different amplifier. And they're going to vary between amplifiers. And it's not say that Logan does it this way and Valcom does it that way and Tucane does it this other way. They're all going to vary even between different manufacturers, even between the same manufacturer. There's So there's no rhyme or reason to really understand that, okay, it's Bogan, I have to do it that way. It's Valcom, I have to do it that way. It doesn't really work like that. Some are going to use a more modern style, RCA style connection, super easy to work with. You take a cable, you plug it into our end, you plug it into the other end, and you're off and running through the races. Some are you going to use more of an old school style tip and ring style connection, where you've got a little screw down terminal on both ends and you're literally hooking up wire between their two and it doesn't mean that say one connection is better than the other they're just two different ways to get from point a to point b and it varies depending on the subtle nuances of impedance and electrical stuff and when you're dealing with amplifiers and it can get really confusing when you're connecting to these multitude of different amplifiers out there they can be labeled with tip and ring positive and negative rca you know, what have you, you're dealing with a music mute or contact closure, it gets super duper confusing when you're looking at a different amplifier, especially some older stuff where the silk screens on these things, you know, have worn off over the 25 years of use. The thing still works great, but you can't see the silk screen on it. So we always recommend reaching out to us or utilizing the huge matrix of connection diagrams that we have on our website that are always being updated by a really good staff over in support um, that get a request from a customer that's trying to connect to a particular amplifier. We do some research into that amplifier and determine the best way to connect to it. And then we create a diagram, kind of like we're showing here, where it's got nice little colored lines in between the specific pins that you're supposed to use for the actual physical connection. So that way, when you've got the boots on the ground and you've got somebody that knows the business end of a screwdriver, they can go and trace those nice colored lines to whichever pin out they're supposed to connect to and be able to make that connection. And another nice thing about these is if there's any particular tips switches or adjustments that need to be made on the amplifier that's all going to be noted on this typically one to at most two page documents for one of our um, connections so it really makes it super duper easy to tell exactly how the connection works just at a glance so in summary when you're dealing with this with the sip paging adapter or the spa configuration there's a couple different options that you can go. Most customers and most users go for the very basic configuration process where they're just doing the SIP registration and they probably check that box to bypass DTMF menus and they're good to go. 
but you can also expand that if you want with stuff like multicast support or adjusting some of the different settings such as the network settings to, to create your own VLAN. Um, but this product is super easy to configure and wire and put into place once you have everything set up. Thank you for watching this edition of CyberSchool. If you have any questions, please get in contact with our sales department. They are available by email at sales at cyberdata.net or by phone at 831-373-2601 extension 334. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe for more content like this from Cyberdata.